All right, everybody, let's get today's show started. Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. My name is Chris Smith, and I work here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, on whose YouTube channel we are now gathered in order to take in another exciting edition of our program. Uh, the Lunchtime Discovery Series is broadcast by us here at the museum, but it's organized and coordinated by the lovely people with the Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality here in North Carolina. So many thanks to them. We have a great partnership, and they do a fantastic job of looking out into the world of science and nature and education, seeing what's happening, what's interesting, what's cool to learn about, and then getting those people to agree to join us on our program and share their expertise and insights and experiences with us. We have a great time every Wednesday learning new things and hearing from really interesting people. And of course, as always, we're going to do that today. Don't forget, uh, we've got a great series coming up for this month. In fact, it's got a cool theme too. They're calling it the Spring Cinema Series. So make sure that you check out the website for the Office of Environmental Education, eenorthcarolina.org. Go ahead and bookmark all of those links in order to come back and join us here for all of our programs. Or you can go even a step further. You can sign up for the Lunchtime Discovery Series email newsletter on their website. And then you'll get the YouTube link to come and join us every single Wednesday in your inbox. That way we're only a click away from new and interesting things. Go ahead and do that. It's definitely going to be worth your time. I guarantee it. Now, for today's program, uh, our guest speaker, in a sense, isn't traveling from very far because today's guest speaker actually works with us here at the Museum of Natural Sciences. Megan McCuller is Collections Manager for Non-Molluscan Invertebrates and happens to be a marine biologist who gets to do some really cool, exciting research, including some of the stuff that we're going to hear about today. And Megan joins me now. Hey, Megan. Hello. Good to see you uh, in your office over there at the research lab just down the road. Yeah, <laughs> I'm on the Wi-Fi here, so my work computer does not have a webcam. Oh, gosh. Well, <laughs> we can we can talk to somebody about that. We can yes, work that out. I need to do that for sure. We'll cobble you one together from plastic parts floating in the ocean covered in Perfect. marine life. Perfect. And then it'll be thematic. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, Megan, I'm excited to hear about uh, your participation in some of this research that's been all of the news lately. And of course, people are talking about plastics in the ocean and marine to be marine debris um, quite a lot these days, which is a good thing. We're thinking about the problem, uh, but it's interesting to see some of the work that you were doing on it. Yeah, it's a very interesting problem. <laughs> that we've got going on for sure. For sure. I'll let you take it away. All right, share my screen. All right, so you can see it now. Looks good. Perfect. So I am going to talk about uh, plastics in the high seas and how they're being uh, colonized by coastal species. And I've got quotation marks around build because we didn't technically build all the plastic like islands um, in the ocean, but they are there and we did technically make them. So I'll just go right ahead. And um, I'm, you might have seen, click, okay. You might have seen some uh, news articles about recent research or more recent research that I've been part of uh, in NPR or one of my favorite titles is from IFL Science, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, now a floating love shack for coastal species. But uh, these are uh, articles based on a paper that just came out in Nature, Ecology and Evolution. You can see here there's a number of authors, I'm like author number 12, but I was the taxonomist for bryozoans or moss animals. And I could spend probably an entire hour and more about talking about bryozoans, but I'm actually not gonna be talking about them too much um, today. So I'm actually going to not talk as much 
about this more recent research, I'm going to focus more on a project that I was part of a few years ago uh, the, that has to do with the Japanese tsunami and the marine debris that was pushed out into the ocean and rafted across the ocean to land on the um, East Pacific coast, so West Pacific coast of North America, California, Oregon, um, Washington, and also Hawaii and Alaska. And this, a paper came out about this in science that was big back then. You might have uh, heard some news about it as well. Tsunami-driven rafting and how coastal species are taking these transoceanic uh, treks across and, um, and landing on the opposite coast. And I also got a pretty long paper out that is open access about the Bryozoans. Um, anybody can access that one. If you're interested in the science paper, it's not open access, but I'd be happy to send it to you. First, I wanted to cover just a few terms that you might hear throughout the talk. Uh, one of the major ones is biofouling, and that's just when organisms settle and accumulate on stuff that's in the water. And this is pretty much undesired. So if you think of uh, pilings or floating docks or plastic in the ocean, marine organisms growing on that, that's biofouling. Um, coastal species are what I'm gonna focus on the most or taxa, and those are not the same species in taxa. Taxes like can be wider groups. So I might use one or the other, and it really just depends on how those things were identified um, or to what level. But typically coastal species are associated with shallow water, neuritic, which are just another word for coastal, um, benthic habitats on a variety of substrates. So not necessarily biofouling, but also like growing on rocks or um, growing on other organisms such as uh, mollusks, um, like bivalve shells and stuff like that. And then pelagic species or taxa are living as obligate neustonic organisms and neuston uh, is on the surface, so floating on the surface, um, waters of the open ocean. And there's, a couple of long-standing beliefs in marine biology. And one of the major ones is that coastal species can't survive for long periods of time in the open ocean. And that's because of the relatively low productivity of the open ocean, because productivity comes from nutrient input to the ocean and there's less nutrient input um, in the open ocean as opposed to near the coast because those nutrients are coming from like running off from the land. Um, and they, those things didn't evolve there. Coastal species didn't evolve there like the pelagic species. So they, in theory, will not be as well suited to those habitats. But at the same time, the rafting of coastal species we believe is how they got between one landmass to another. But they did this historically on natural materials like algae or wood or pumice, which is like lava rock. And they would live on this stuff, but that's biodegradable. And so you're either gonna sink or you're not gonna or the, your, material, your rafting material is going to biodegrade before you can get to another landmass. So those typically would have to be like pretty short distances. Um, so maybe transit times of months, maybe years, depending on what it is. And that's historically as in like before ships and stuff like that. And so Rafting is risky for coastal species. There's not a lot of good outcomes, we think, for coastal species in the open ocean rafting. Your raft might sink, 
that's obviously not good because you're going to have a less good time at the bottom of the ocean uh, than you might be having on the on the surface. So another is exposure to inhospitable conditions. The open oceans, you've got the sun beating down. Um, you've got uh, like wave action, predators, like birds, so on and so forth. You may never contact another hospitable environment. If you came from a coast, you may never find another coast. And if you find another coast, it may be inhospitable. <laughs> so really the only good outcome we think is landing in a hospitable environment. So that's like, first you've got to make it through all these bad conditions to land in a good condition and by then you may be dead. So <laughs> there's a lot of bad outcomes here if you're a marine coastal invertebrate. The problem is, is it's difficult to study this. Um, the transoceanic dispersal for long distances, it's only been recorded for short distances until 2012. And that's when we learned a lot of new things. So in March, on March 11th, 2011, was the Great East Japan earthquake off the Tohoku region of Honshu, Japan. This thing was huge and it caused a massive tsunami. This was the worst earthquake and tsunami that Japan has ever faced. It caused massive devastation and killed thousands of people. And it ejected billions of objects out into the ocean. And it wasn't just Japan that it affected. It affected the entire Pacific Ocean. It destroyed the Darwin Marine Lab in the Galapagos. And it broke off a piece of an ice shelf in Antarctica. So this thing was wild and caused a lot of damage. And again, lots of stuff put out into the ocean, an estimated 20 billion tons washed out to sea. And these things were either in the water prior to the tsunami. So boats and ropes and buoys and things like that are considered marine origin debris or terrestrial origin debris, which were items on land prior to the tsunami, such as household items, um, construction materials, and so on and so forth. Here are just some of the objects. We have uh, boats, ropes and buoys, uh, lots of vessels actually, lots of crates and, and buckets. And um, this is like a household item, this little bucket here, ladders, um, this is a tree. And this is construction materials, wood, and we know they're Japanese in origin because of the way that it's a specific way of building um, and also the types of, of wood. These items are not JTMD or Japanese tsunami marine debris. And you can tell because it only, these things only have pelagic species. And these gooseneck barnacles here and the genus Lepus, those are pelagic species. I could go my entire life without encountering another Lepus barnacle. <laughs> I had to deal with those so many times. Uh, and they're, they're kind of weird, but interesting. Also, there's pelagic bryzoans. There's a few species of those. So if items only have these pelagic species of bryzoans and or pelagic species of barnacles and no coastal species on them, we can assume that they originated in the ocean as opposed to already on a coast or near a coast because they don't have any coastal species on them. So all of these things, after possibly uh, traveling down south uh, along the Jap Japan coast, they went into the gyre. 
the North Pacific gyre specifically, and have been just floating around and, and traveling and possibly washing ashore on the west coast of the U.S. There were a lot of models that uh, scientists did predicting how long it would take for objects to reach the west coast of the U.S. And it was believed it would happen like four years after uh, the tsunami in 2011. So objects were predicted to come ashore in like 2015 or so. And this is, I apologize for the quality of this background image, but it's the only one I could find. Um, but this is a theoretical position of the object field in 2012. But the thing is, is that things started washing ashore in early 2012, just one year later. A soccer ball, a motorcycle. So again, household items, um, these things like the soccer ball had identifying information on it and the motorcycle had a license plate. So these things could be tracked to their owners, actually. Um, there was also this ship, a crewless ship called the Rio on Maru. And before anybody could get to it to see what kinds of things were growing on it, they sunk it. But the first major landing that made us realize, hey, we should probably look at what's going on here was this dock. This is a huge dock, as you can tell by the scale of it, that landed on June 5th, 2012, just a little bit more than a year later. Wash ashore in Agate Beach, Oregon. And we know where it came from because there was a plaque on it that said it came from the port of Misawa and it was built in 2008. And if we look at the port of Misawa, before the tsunami, there were four docks there. And after the tsunami, there were none. And these things are gigantic. Each one is 66 feet long by 19 feet wide, by seven feet tall, <laughs> and they weighed 188 tons. And they're made of like concrete and crushed styrofoam and plastic uh, buoys um, and bumpers. They were basically indestructible, but the thing was is that where they were connected to the dock was not indestructible and they likely got ripped off of the dock um, when all the water pulls out before the tsunami happens and then they were ejected out. And so they were built in 2008 and they were ejected out to sea in 2011. So they were probably all, well, they we know they were supporting a thriving fouling community. So they were covered in algae and mussels and barnacles and all sorts of other marine life. And on June 5th, there was that one that washed ashore in Oregon. We know there's four, if you'll remember. The second one was encountered off the coast of Hawaii by fishermen who were, who were using it as a fish aggregation device because fish were probably just eating all the stuff that was on uh, growing on the fowling community. But they didn't report it until they had left and then it was never seen again. And that happened in 2012 of September. The third one washed ashore in Olympic National Park, Washington in December of 2012. And more lepus barnacles. And the fourth one has never been seen. So two out of four of these gigantic 188 ton docks are just floating around in the ocean and they are not lit. So it's kind of interesting, um, kind of scary. But if we go back to the first uh, Misawa dock, what was living on there, the fowling community, there were a ton of stuff of many different phyla. 128 species were found and many of them were alive. And that's when 
researchers were like, hey, uh, turns out stuff can live going from Japan to the U.S. West Coast. And some of these species are already invasive uh, pre the tsunami. The Mediterranean mussel, Midlis gallo provincialis, that's actually invasive in Japan. And it's already invasive in California. Um, and it was on these docks. There's also Undaria penitivida or wakame that was on the docks and it's already invasive in California and elsewhere in the world. Same with these uh, sea stars and a number of other things like the Asian shore crab, Hemigrapsis sanguineus, and these um, spiny caprellid amphipods or skeleton shrimp. These two things are invasive in New England. So it's kind of interesting that things that are already invasive elsewhere in the world or already in the US as well, we're on these docks. So this isn't just Misawa one, this is JTMD overall. Nearly 400 species from 16 phyla have arrived on items that were intercepted, JTMD items that were intercepted between 2012 and 2017. A lot of these are mollusks and bryozoans and algae, and also um, worms, like polychaetes. So lots and lots of different marine inverts and algae. So now I'm gonna go through a few of the lessons that we've learned from this study is that Coastal species can raft for many years and arrive on another coast alive. We knew that from, you know, shorter journeys, but now we know it for all the way across the Pacific. And it's not just inverts and algae, it's also vertebrates. So there's actually this ship or um, fishing vessel that had a barred knife jaw, Japanese species of fish, inside its wet well. And most of the vessels, as you might see from some of the photos, most of the vessels arrived upside down, but this one, the Saishu Maru, arrived right side up. So it had water in the wet well. What we assume happened is that these fish just were in the wrong place at the wrong time and a wave hit and put them in this wet well. And they had survived by like eating stuff that was in this wet well. So you've seen this slide already, but again, lots of living species. And it depends on the kind of organism and how well it does on these transoceanic journeys. So this, this shows the date intercepted, um, and how well these things did or whether they're found alive or dead. A lot of things it's like, well, kind of 50, 50, they may, there may be more dead ones. Um, the, the later it is at, uh, post the tsunami, but something like middleless, those have been fine. They're, they are more likely to be found alive on stuff intercepted later. So they're, they're doing just fine. And that brings us to our next point, which I'm gonna use amphipods for, but species having rafted many years, maybe reproducing. And I say maybe because not all of them are, um, it depends on the species and lots of different things, but we find amphipod males and amphipod females, and there's multiple size classes there's probably reproduction going on here. And that's not even counting if you, if you find them and they're gravid or with eggs or young. So the assumption is that some, will, some species will have gone through multiple generations on board their raft to continue the population. Um, sometimes uh, they do this thing where they like break down a little bit and because 
the open ocean is an ideal conditions for them. And then once they reach the coast, they'll be like, yay, and <laughs> start reproducing again. Using an example of my little guys or bryozoans, moss animals, we saw them sometimes growing on mobile species, such as uh, this is a skeleton shrimp or caprellid, and this is a leg of a planes crab, if I remember correctly. And planes crabs are pelagic species, but they're still mobile. So that means that the bryozoans were reproducing sexually and then reproducing asexually to form colonies on mobile species while on these rafts. Certain taxa are better suited to rafting. So we often found some taxa just on lots and lots of objects. Um, I've mentioned Middleus gallo provincialis a number of times, and that's because they were on a lot of objects and there were often a lot of them. Um, there were also quite a lot of bryozoans. There's a few bryozoans here. Uh, so it really just depends on the taxa, but they can be good at, at rafting better than others, it appears at this time. And then we can also interpret what route they took across the Pacific based on the species of diversity. Um, so as we think as objects drifted south of Tuaku, where the tsunami, earthquake and tsunami hit um, past this uh, called the Bozo Peninsula, warm water species would have been added to the rafting community. <laughs> so if you start out with a coastal um, base community of these cold water species, and then it drifts south, you might start seeing these more warm water species. So you now have these objects that start with cold water species, now have warm water species, <coughs> and then are getting um, pelagic species as they go out into the gyre. Again, going to bryozoans, there are a few species of pelagic bryozoans. Um, the two I'm gonna focus on here are in the genus Jellyella. And Jellyella eburnia appears to be a more warm water species. And we saw it on objects that wash ashore on the west coast of North America, as well as Hawaii. Whereas with Jellyella tuberculata, we only saw it on the west coast of the US on intercepted items, but we didn't see it on objects that rafted ashore in Hawaii. So that can tell us what uh, one of the ways that objects, the trek that they took. New species can also be discovered on rafted debris, such as this red algae in, that was described in 2017, and a bryozoan that uh, myself and a couple co-authors described in 2017. And this isn't surprising because there's not a ton of <laughs> taxonomists. It takes time to like survey uh, um, locations and identify species. And if you're, there's not as much scrutiny on the coast at all times as there were on tsunami um, marine debris. So it makes sense that these maybe species that don't do, aren't as prolific on the coast in their native environment, may have a better chance of proliferating on, uh, on these rafts because there's just more space to spread out. And as I mentioned earlier, known invasive species are also capable of rafting. And I say two because these things are already invasive in other parts of the world. And that likely wasn't due to rafting. It was probably due to some things like ballast water, which is the 
um, assumed vector for, for a lot of marine species. An interesting thing was that tsunami debris arrived in these pulses, and these typically happen in spring, probably due to storms and currents. And things have been arriving years later. So the major projects kind of like fizzled out in 2017 the funding that is and um but things were still washing ashore despite that we had some stuff in 2017 six years later that had these anemones on them in bandon oregon in april long beach washington this buoy had some uh, mollusks seven years later in 2018 we've got uh, more mollusks here these jingle shells on a looks like a buoy barnacles on the styrofoam and more styrofoam that has these Asian shore crabs in July. And yet more still, another JTMD vessel washed ashore. This one, like the Sai Shumaru, appears to have arrived right side up and had living species on it. 10 years later in 2021, three vessels washed ashore um, in Washington and Oregon, and these also had living marine invertebrate species on them. So it's still happening. And the takeaway for this is that this was a natural disaster, which these things just happen. And it's not the first earthquake and tsunami Japan has experienced, though it was the worst. But something like this hasn't happened before with all the plastics being ejected because we've got this 21st century coastal infrastructure. And as I'm sure you've all seen, um, coastal areas and towns, they're gigantic um, and they're only growing. So not only do we have all this already biofouled material in the water, again, boats and uh, buoys and things like that. You've also got all of this stuff that has the potential to become biofouled in coastal Japanese waters and elsewhere in the world on, on any coastal area. But for JTMD, at least, we know that this stuff came from a known source, Honshu, Japan, at a known time, uh, March 11th, 2011. And that is something that has never happened before for us to, to study this transoceanic stuff. So as a first look at coastal biofouling ocean organisms having gone across the ocean. And a lot of them were still living and became reproductive when they reached another coast or have been productive through their trek that made it from Asia to North America. And so this was a uni unique opportunity to study something like this. So we go back to our longstanding beliefs in marine biology, um, that coastal species can't survive for long periods of time or reproduce due to low pro productivity. And that historically rafting occurred on natural things. We're gonna think of some new uh, beliefs because that's how science works. And that's that coastal species are capable of surviving in the open ocean for lengthy periods of time. And the non-biodegradable things like plastics can support and raft coastal fouling communities long distances for many years. And things can still arrive alive and reproductive on an opposite coast. So if I change um, pace a little bit, there are a couple of papers that came out by the same first author. The first one in 2014 that estimates more than 5 trillion plastic pieces at sea. And this is the world world's oceans and not just the Pacific. To 
earlier this year in March, 170 trillion. That's nine years and the estimate has increased by 165 trillion. That's a lot of stuff. And so if I go from that to this, this more recent project, this was um, part of the Float Eco project. And if you are interested in learning more about that, it's floateco.org. Um, in late 2018 or early 2019, um, about 100 plastic marine debris items were collected from the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, and they were analyzed for what kinds of marine organisms were growing on them by taxonomic experts. And once again, my my job was to identify the bryozoans. So here are some of the kinds of plastic items, like pieces of crates, um, nets and ropes, bottles. Uh, this looks like a piece of a buoy that has been broken. Same with this, another plastic piece. And these are hydroids growing on them, um, which are Cnidarians related to anemones and, and coral and sea anemones. You can see some bryozoans on there as well. And these, these little boogery things are, are sea anemones. <laughs> Whoops. So some of the findings from this uh, study is it found 46 taxa from six phyla, so a lot less than the nearly 400 from JTMD. Um, but these, there were a lot fewer objects. JTMD was over 600 objects. Um, and we also found that 37 or taxa or 80% were coastal species. And the most diverse were bryozoans and arthropods. Um, we also found that the richness of pelagic species, oopsies, accidental clicking, uh, levels out. So as you can see here, it sort of like levels out because there's only so many uh, pelagic species. So you're not really gonna find a ton of new ones the more objects you look at. Whereas in contrast, the more objects you look at, the more coastal species you're likely to find. We also found that coastal taxa were richest on ropes and nets, and that could just be because that there's ropes and nets have a lot of surface area to them, so there's more area to grow. Um, another finding, and these are my words, is that pelagic taxa are not very picky. They're just like, I'll take whatever you got and I'll grow on that, no problem, um, because space is the limiting factor here. You need something to grow on. So why be picky about what you're growing on? Um, and also the debris items had both pelagic and coastal taxa co-occurring. And that's an interesting finding. So if I go back to this slide, which I had earlier, this is all pretty much the same. R rafting is still risky, but whereas we thought that never contacting another hospitable environment was an outcome. I mean, it's it's still an outcome, but it may not be as bad of an outcome as we thought it was previously. And I had to include a life finds a way uh, if here. <laughs> so now if we go back to our beliefs in, about marine biology, um, Coastal species are more than capable of, of surviving in the open ocean for lengthy periods of time and are actually now occurring with pelagic species. And we've um, sort of made a new term for that, which is neopelagic communities. So it's like pelagic communities, but there's coastal species there now, so neopelagic. Um, and that the number of non-biodegradable plastic items in the ocean is only increasing. And as it's increasing, that's more and more surface area for these things to live on and colonize. And 
also opportunities for dispersal. So one of the questions that is often gotten by those of us doing these sorts of research is that we don't um, know if species have invaded by a rafting or not that we know of um, is the short answer, but the long answer is just because we don't know doesn't mean species haven't become invaders yet. And that's because lag times are often long between colonizing a new area, establishing a population, and being detected by taxonomists or otherwise. And there's also no formal surveys in place because they're typically difficult to fund. Um, if surveys are happening, they're usually like bio blitzes or iNaturalist is, is one way to find out uh, things like this as well. Um, and then you need to have taxonomic experts to identify species. And when you've got like 400 species from 16 phyla, you're gonna need a lot of different taxonomists who specialize in all these different things. And taxonomists have been over time sort of like continuously undervalued and funded. So that can be an issue. But we might have one. We're not sure that um, in JTMD, we had this anemone in the genus Anthoplura that was on an object or a few objects. And in 2018, it was actually found in Southern California in the Rocky Intertidal. Um, so we're not sure if it's invaded and established a population but genetics are being done uh, to figure that out because with anemones, you sort of need genetics and morphology isn't always um, like the way to perfectly figure that out. And then I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but basically the entire trip from one coast to another has all these processes where you're losing species and you're gaining species uh, due to, you know, uh, just as an example, you're getting the, the objects battered against the coast and other objects and waves. You're gaining things by um, new species colonizing those objects as they go further south and with other objects that have different kinds of species. Um, and you're losing them from predation and you're gaining new ones from reproduction and so on and so forth. And then when they reach the, the new coast, you have inoculation. Um, they have to survive. So even if they get there, they've got to survive and then reproduce. And they've got to reproduce enough to establish a population and then possibly spread somewhere else. So, that's sort of what's happening once things get to a new location. And then I'll end it there. <laughs> and stop sharing. All right. Thanks, Megan. <laughs> sort of a, you know, just very... <laughs> We yeah we zip through like the last twelve years of ocean marine debris wildlife research and <laughs> and plastics, but that was I mean really interesting stuff, great stuff, um, and I'm impressed with like how thoughtful the work was, like that uh, to to take advantage and pull the resources together, for example, for the the tsunami debris research. To, to see that event and go, well, here's, this is terrible, but here's an opportunity to possibly rewrite the understanding of something like how these critters survive. Right. And it was actually done in conjunction with Japanese officials as well. So um, they had a part in this because objects would be, would be found that belong to people and the owners were contacted and sometimes the owners would want it back. And sometimes they were like, no, you can keep it. So 
it it really was like a very collaborative work. And it wasn't just, you know, Americans taking this stuff and, and using it without any input of Japanese people. Right. Yeah, that's really important. I'm curious about the invasive the species you identified that are invasive in other places. Uh and you I think you were kind of getting at it there at the very end with the invasion model overlay. Um, but do you think that these species that are invasive in some places in different parts of the world are best suited or better suited for surviving these long-term rafting voyages on, you know, inorganic stuff that won't break down and what that might mean for the future of, you know, invasions across coastlines? Yeah, um, I mean, it does seem that species that are known invaders elsewhere in the world are better suited to, I, they're usually more generalists overall. They can withstand um, a wider variety of conditions like temperature and salinity. They are maybe omnivores instead of specialists. So they, they'll they eat a lot of different things instead of specialize on um, certain things. Um, so yeah, they, seems like there are species that are better suited to it but maybe some coastal species are not can't really say realizing because they're not thinking like that but um finding that they might be better suited to rafting than for instance um, being transported in ballast water or other ways mm, right right and i was thinking about that to the like the abilities or adaptations that different species would have native or non-native for being able to survive on like a piece of plastic and if or what the assumptions are or how that might influence what species you see when you collect plastic trash in the ocean and and go to look at it like do you see like you mentioned there you know several taxonomic groups that are present. And so it seems like a lot of these critters have the ability uh, to survive for long periods of time and, and the ability to do this. But I still wonder if there's some sort of selection bias against the ones that can't or what's uh, what you might expect to see that you don't see maybe is what I'm getting at. Yeah, I mean, it really depends on the species. Uh, I'm a bryzoan person, so I know that there is like, there are bryzoans that pretty much only grow on algae, and you're not going to see them on rocks or other natural substrates, um, and you're not going to see them on plastic. So one, but there are invasive bryzoans that grow on algae. One in New England is Membranipra membranacea. And um, it's grown like crazy all over uh, kelp in New England, um, especially north of Cape Cod. But you're not going to find it on plastic. But there's other other species that will grow on all sorts of things and others that are now like, maybe plastic is <laughs> where I want to be. Because you see a lot of coastal um, like fouling communities on floating docks that are just absolutely covered in sea squirts and um, barnacles and bryzoans and mussels. And you're going to see a lot of species over and over again in these fowling communities. Um, and you aren't going to as much see things that prefer to grow on rocks in the intertidal zone, which I know we don't have as much here, but or in North Carolina, but <laughs> um, oh they do exist. <laughs> or like on shells. So it really just depends on the makeup of the Fallon community, because if the Fallon community has a bunch of bivalves and you've got stuff that has no problem growing on bivalves, but doesn't like growing on plastic, they still have options. It's right. all about free space. So the, the limiting factor now we think is not and the phytoplankton or the productivity, it's space availability. And that's a huge 
you know, thing for that things compete over. And as you showed us, the, there's a lot more space out there now because of all of this extra debris. Yeah. <laughs> That's wild. That's wild to think about that the, the impact of trillions of pieces of plastic in the ocean and other trash uh, or debris from things like tsunamis leads to just these huge ecological changes and even rewrites our understanding of uh, how the open ocean works, at least in terms yeah. of these mapping <laughs> hypotheses. That's wild. And okay, it shows uh, how much we still don't know. Gosh, so true. Okay, let me get uh, some questions from the chat for you. First one up, now that coastal species are living in open oceans, how are the increasing concentrations of these unique species in middle of ocean changing dynamics of predator species and altering food webs? Oh, that's a good question. I would imagine that um, species that like pelagic species now have a wider range of prey um, and you're going to have competition and predation between pelagic species and coastal species that you didn't previously have. Uh, but there is also, again, just a lot that we don't know yet, because as far as we know, these neopelagic communities are fairly new. So that's like a ripe area to study. All right. Next one, we've seen the term plastosphere used in relation to marine debris. Can you explain what it is and does it relate to what you're studying? Um, I believe it does, yeah, for sure. That these coastal species are using this plastosphere to, to live in places where they weren't previously thought to be able to live. So the plastosphere is this idea. So so is it like this idea that the plastic is making up its own unique ecological communities? And then I think so, yeah. Like supports. Yeah, because I mean, pelagic species have been taking advantage of plastic, we know, because past studies that have just collected stuff from the garbage patches usually just have pelagic species on them. And uh, now we know that they have coastal species on them, probably in part due to the Japanese tsunami that inoculated these garbage patches with, you know, Western Pacific coastal species. And if they're reproducing, it doesn't mean they're staying on one raft because a lot of them have larvae that can uh, go from they they swim in the open ocean and then they go colonize another piece of plastic or mobile species two pieces of plastic are next to each other you might just pop on over so <laughs> um i think it's definitely changing these uh ecosystems oh wow okay Interest interesting to think that we've we've made like I don't know. Now I just think of it. We've created coastlines in the middle of the ocean out of plastic. And all of these coastal species can now hang out because it's, it's not so different or it's yeah, a little bit I mean, different, but they've it's got similar to building condos on the, on the coast. Oh my gosh. Do you want to pay a bunch of money to live on the beach? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. That's, that's cr wild to think about. <laughs> Okay, uh, another one for you. Have there been any successful efforts to responsibly treat ballast water? Oh, I am not an expert in ballast water. I know an expert on ballast water. Okay. <laughs> um, I know there are efforts to treat ballast water for sure, but I could not list them off the top of my head. I know there's a few different um, ways to do it, but... I was not prepared to answer a question like that, to be right. honest. <laughs> and I'm curious if you see or noticed differences in the communities, the species communities and in the taxa of 
the animals on debris after like a year of being out in the ocean before washing up on a coast versus some of those pieces of debris that showed up a decade later. Yeah, um, we did find that you get fewer and fewer species on items that washed up later. So, yeah, <laughs> for sure. So some selection that happens over a longer period of time. Yeah. What can continue to survive in the open ocean. Mm -hmm. And so things, mobile species are going to fall off. You know, the nice thing for me about Bryce Owens is that they have a calcified skeleton so even if they're dead i'm gonna know that they were there um but that can still be rubbed away over time so yeah the the longer the stuff is out there the fewer species were on there so there's still a question of how long coastal species can live uh, on rafted debris um, and which ones are best at it but again, that's like a long-term thing um, that needs to be studied and we need funding for that. And <laughs> sometimes yeah, it's just not there. So, Well, interesting stuff. Uh, I always like to leave it on a mystery if we can. But uh, thank you for joining the program today, Megan, uh, sharing some of the research that you've been involved in and some of the really interesting and important implications of it. Yeah, thanks for having me. And again, I I put my email in there, so feel free to contact me if you have questions um, or want to get that science paper if it can't be accessed another way. Great stuff. And hey, thanks everybody for tuning in to today's edition of the Lunchtime Discovery Series. It was great to spend the afternoon with everybody. Make sure that you're here next Wednesday again at noon for another edition of the program. We'll have Dr. Wendy Bohan, uh, who's going to talk about earthquakes in the United States and specifically here in the eastern part of the U.S. If you want to learn all about that, I hope that you'll go ahead and bookmark the link or sign up for the newsletter. Come and join us. We'll be right here. Gather around the glow of the museum's YouTube channel to meet more interesting people doing interesting work out there. Until next week, everybody, take care and we'll see you again soon. Bye, everybody.